This meeting is being recorded. Hey everybody, this is Munch and Steed. It is Sisters with Superpowers, and of course, this is a seat at the table. There is no other sister that clearly has positioned herself to push through and share with us what it is to, as we define Sister Superpower, create a safe space with benefits for people inside her organization. Um, the benefits, we'll talk about the discussion, the road there, but I, I wanna thank uh, you, Ms. Parker. Um, you can share all the details of your quick journey if you would share a story, but just why you still choose to be a sister with superpower and empower so many on this journey to integrate in corporate America with the global company. Thank you, one. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. I pay homage to all of the people who made sure that I could see myself in the future and that I was included in the picture. And so I stay in this work because I want all women of color, particularly black women, to recognize that we are still in the picture, that we're in the future and that the future won't be it if we're not in it. And so many people you know, did that for me along the way. And when we find ourselves, and when I found myself in places where like I'm the only one, that messes with your head where you think, oh my gosh, I look to my left and my right and I don't see anybody who looks like me. But we always come with community. And I always wanna remind people who are coming behind me and people who are beside me that we always come in community even if we are in the same rooms at the same time and just you know real quick with my journey i grew up in a small town in north carolina high point predominantly black neighborhood went to predominantly uh, black schools the high school i went to was designed for integration left there went to hampton university so go pirates and my brother and I are first generation college. I am first generation corporate. And so I didn't have anybody, you know, there in front of me who had been there, but I was able to pull that together. My mother, you know, biggest supporter, my parents, but they, it took me to a point, but there were things that happened that I needed to navigate that they didn't know how to navigate. Um, and so that was where like mentoring and sponsorship became really important because the higher level you go in your positioning, it gets isolating because you're, as you're going up, you don't see as many people like you. So those mentors and sponsors become important. So that's incredibly important to me to give back. I, I love that. And um it's honest and, and HBCUs do make a difference. And you're an example of a, a lighthouse for so many of us to be able to navigate. But if you would begin, because many people think we probably had a conversation and they don't know anywhere where you are the global, not, not just local, but global lead. Why don't you share with them, surprise for all of you out there, um, just share where you are and what it's like to be at a global company versus a local company. So I am the chief diversity officer at Google globally. It's an amazing place to be. And one of the things that makes it so amazing is when you think about a global company that spans the world, like what does it mean to consider all the different types of communities that are represented across Google and not only internally, all of the creators, all of the users, you know, think about the reach and the platform. And that is a sobering thing to think about and the responsibility of that. So I really think of myself as like the chief steward officer, like stewardship of inclusive culture, stewardship of equity, um, I find myself educating a lot, building a lot, um, and more than anything, influencing across cultures, across leaders, and across groups. You know, when you first got to um, college, did you ever imagine, uh, and if you would tell us a story where somebody poured into you that was a woman, that kind of gave you a tenant 
um, a spirit that you walk into those rooms with, if you would, please. Oh, yeah. So Lottie Knight, she was my mass media professor at Hampton University, really poured into me um, because I was first generation college. So I didn't actually know exactly like what to expect. And it was my professor who pulled me aside. And she actually, she told me what she saw in me. She told me what she expected of me, what she expected that my assignments would look like. And that when I thought I had it right, that I better go back and look at it two more times and make sure that I didn't miss anything. But do you know, I still carry that same skill set. Like even now, when I think I got it right, I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Lottie Knight told me I better go back and check it twice. But just the gift of having classes that were small enough that my professor could speak in my life and give me like words of wisdom that I still use today. What a gift. You know, thanks, Ms. Knight. But for those who now, when you whisper and you're in leadership and you're really working to help them navigate uh, culturally across the globe, so even our expectation of the role of women here versus the role of women around the world, how do you whisper and give insight to leadership for them to understand, uh, to move this ball forward in, in a culturally relevant way? So a couple of things. So one, I talk about leading across difference and how important it is to be culturally competent to be able to lead across difference because even encouragement has an equity lens. So when you think about how you motivate like women in different countries, so how you motivate Asian women versus how you motivate black women or Latino women can look different. And if you don't know that, someone could walk away without even recognizing that you're encouraging. And then the other thing I talk about is the difference between being hyper visible and invisible because a lot of times with women you're either hyper visible or you're invisible and neither is the place that you want to be you know we want to make sure that women are so embedded in the workplace and in the culture that we're normalized being here you know instead of shrinking um in the workplace and the role that you see women what would you share with women who are really working to make their way in corporate America, how to show up and how to ask for that mentor that may or may not look like them so that they can begin to know that they want to be a part of that assimilation into corporate life. Well, I, I'll, I tell them what I wish that someone had told me, which is know what you add. Like we're additive to the picture and so many times we're coached, I was coached this way, that you have to fit in. And what does it mean to fit in? And even in the interview, like, are you matching the style of dress of the corporation that you're interviewing with? Do you talk the talk? But that's not really where the magic sauce is. The magic sauce is in knowing what you add. And if you have the confidence of knowing what you add, that actually like levels your game up a notch. It gives you a confidence. This is where we adjust our crown, so to speak. And a lot of times, particularly earlier in our career, we don't know enough to know what we add. So this is where the power of questions. So sometimes when you're in a room where you're not sure what to do or what to say, a great question can show your intellect. It can show your keen insights, highlight your business acumen, and it can also like really open up dialogue. And so questions allow us to go a little bit deeper, but also to showcase who we are. And I, I think just the science of asking great questions is something that we can all draw from. Okay, I wanna follow that up with, you're a young lady and you're really working to ask a question, not sure when you should. How do you learn the power of asking questions? Can you give just a story for those who haven't been in the room on how they can begin to show up by asking questions? I can, and I'll start with what not to do. Do not ask a question just to show that you're in the room. Because if you only ask a question to show, hey, I'm here, you're actually on the wrong track. 
So the best way to ask a question, I'll give a story, is to listen intently to what's happening and to be so present that you're looking for where you add and you know how to ask a well-timed question. And so I'm thinking about a time in my career when I led a staffing organization and people would, you know, scream at me and they would really want to know why was I not hiring to fill their need in the time that they needed. And I, what I learned in that situation was to go back to what do you need? What are you trying to solve for? And if that particular candidate isn't available, like what's the 80% solution? And then I would pair it back. Here's what I hear you saying. Can you confirm? And that's the other part of powerful questions. It allows you to get receipts in a way that's culturally um, acceptable. And so that's a good example of how to like listen, check in, open up the dialogue, and then go back and confirm and walk away with some receipts on and clarity on what to do next. Thank you. And as a sister with superpower, you truly know what it is. You're creating these safe spaces for culture, for people in the workplace. Um, but now if we can pivot, for those who want to be like you, for those who want to know what it is to navigate, what are some of the habits that you really know that they may not whisper when we're at Hampton, if you don't have somebody pouring into you, that you know three things that corporate America is watching and looking for that you've got to have or you'll alienate yourself. And, and, and if you would, just share some of that so that we can create that safe space and then people can hear what you have to say and know that it's a benefit to them. First and foremost, business acumen. Know the company, know the company revenue, know what the product is, know what the service is, know that inside and outside. So beyond your gift, your talent, your skill, have business acumen, know how you make money, know what you know that commodity is. So business acumen, first and foremost. Second thing, build relationships, be a master at building relationships. So if you think about it, if you got on the elevator, you should be able to have a mini conversation with anybody who steps on that elevator. And that's how you know you're doing it well. And you can actually practice this skill set now that some of the COVID uh, restrictions are lifting and we're seeing people in person just by striking up random conversations with people um, in environments and then always over deliver. So always give more than is expected because then you'll be branded as knowing the business, having keen insights, being great at building relationships. And then you'll also be known for, hey, go to her. She's always gonna give you what you want and you're gonna get a little bit extra. And people don't naturally tell you that. I believe that for sure. When we think about your legacy, um, and you're creating a legacy now. We appreciate your commitment to come on a black owned media platform, show up and represent. But for some, they need some personal coaching and they probably need to reach out to you or someone else just to kind of understand, you know, I'm in mid-level, I'd like to be an executive one day. One day. Why is coaching so critical to professional development? Well, coaching, number one, coaching is critical because none of us is perfect. We all have blind spots. And so first, allowing somebody to like speak into your life and build in that level of trust is critical because people will be able to see some things about you that you might not be able to see for yourself and seek out people who believe that you can. Like go to people who embrace you who see your future, who want to support you. Don't go to people who are like, you know, like dream stealers and who always speak negative. You want to go to people um, who are very positive because who you go to for coaching is critically important. You want those people who are like, when, when the glass is half full, is full. It's not like half empty. 
those are the types of people that you want to be around. And you want people who believe and who know that you're supposed to be where you need to be and they're willing to like make sure that you get there. Um, when you think of a sister with superpowers now and you're literally working to be a leader, um, how do they find their sea legs when they're in an environment where it's pretty much male dominant? Tech tends to be this way. How do they show up and get their bearings on being successful in a gender dominant industry? This is where community is critically important. Um, employee resource groups, finding people who are similarly situated is important. It's a way to create community where it doesn't naturally exist. And if you don't have that, finding people who are in your like industry, like through professional networks, through your churches, through your nonprofits, where you go volunteer, like finding community is important and making sure that you do have people who you can scream with. I always tell people, have a screen buddy, have somebody that you can just go off. And then at the end, they'll say, are you done? Okay, straighten your shirt, like fix your hair, pat your hair down, and then they'll send you back out again because you need an outlet, but you need an outlet that's trusted. And so that's where screen buddies, you know, become really important too, in addition to the people who are coaching you and who are pouring into you because it really is a collective. There's not very much that we can do by ourselves or isolated. Community is critical. Well, I, I love that you share that because I think you kind of gave us places in the lifestyle of an employee that they can actually build those community relationships. Um, you say that, but information for that young executive that is just starting and she's leaving a Hampton or a Howard or a FAM, and we're talking about reading, insight, information acquisition. What are your habits, if you would share a few, on how you get the information in and spend time growing the knowledge base that you have inside? So one of the things I do, I actually do a stakeholder mapping. And so I think about like who's most influential like across that set of, you know, the organization or a team that I need to approach or break into and not just who leads it, like who's influential, like where does the influence come from? Because it might not always be with the leader. And often if you can't get to the leader of an organization, you need to go one step down and you need to think about who's pouring into that leader. Who's that leader listening to? And that's a stakeholder mapping so that you find a way to credibly like build those relationships, reach out, ask for an informational meeting, tell them, you know, you so admire them, you'd love to get time on their calendar, you know, start to do those reach outs. And then when, before you close that meeting, you say, hey, I'd love to come back. You know, is quarterly okay, twice a year, whatever that feels right to you in that meeting. But putting yourself out there becomes really important um, to do that. And then asking for feedback. And I don't think we do this enough. And so when you're talking to people, say, is there something that I could have done to have made this better? Or what would have taken this up a notch? Or is there something that you expected to see that you didn't? Because those are the nuggets that we need to know. Because a lot of people will be quick to give you know, positive feedback, but a little bit reluctant, especially people who aren't culturally competent, you know, won't necessarily give feedback for improvement. But when you ask for it, you're making it psychologically safe for the other person to give it. But it's often, for me personally, it's when I've made the biggest mistakes that I have had the greatest learnings. But being open about that is important. That is so powerful. I mean, that is literally powerful. Um, everybody wants to be empowered and assisted with superpower like you. Uh, obviously, I believe that in my heart. Um, you're accomplished, but at the same time when you're there and you are really working to get your mental together and there's a pull on family, what are some of the other 
coaching things, if you would share, on how to keep your mental balance and your 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 well being together in a in a in a turbulent time, and you still have to show up at work. Oh yes, or things that can happen. Uh, I call that boundaries. So really understanding what your boundaries are. What are your limits? Does everybody have access to you? Because if everybody has access to you, that's probably a signal that the right boundaries aren't in place. And then what's your shutoff time? Like, when is it acceptable, you know, just to turn off and no one can get to you? So I think boundaries are really important. I'm reading this book, um, Nedra Tawab, and she has a book on like find peace by setting boundaries. And it talks about the personal and the professional. So that's one way to maintain. And then the other one is being still from the inside out. Sometimes my day goes by so fast, I can't even hear myself think. And so sometimes I just sit down without TV, without internet, without anything, just so that I can be still enough to hear myself think. And we're so used to being fed, we can take our phones everywhere. And we're so used to this, you know, just constantly our minds just going, 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 going and multiplexing. But for, for me, I have to be still from the inside out. And I, I just need to be quiet and just allow whatever's inside to come up so that I can think about that. And once it's out, you know, I can move forward. And there was a woman at church who actually gave me the best idea. Sometimes at night, you know how you get ready to go to bed, but all these thoughts are racing, so you can't calm down. What she said was get two journals. One is a journal just to kind of like pour out everything that's inside. But for me, when I'm journaling and I'm doing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't do this. Oh my gosh, I didn't do that. So it disrupts that flow. But in the second journal, that becomes the to-do list so that you can go right back to pouring out. So you can go from, okay, I'm gonna go put that on the list, but then I'm gonna go back. But that discipline is really helpful and healthy for getting the right things out, getting the things on the right list, and then being able to just sleep and rest. You dropped a gem, but for those who don't know, why should you journal? We should all journal so that we can one, live from the inside out. Two, get the things that are inside out. And then it's a record. Like being able to go back and look at where you were six months ago or a year ago, or where were we in March of 2020 when we all started to go home and recognize, you know, that COVID was real. Like what, what that reference point is from then to now is important. We see growth there, or sometimes we see that we were in a high growth and then we went the other way and we get back on track. So there are many like mental and emotional health reasons to journal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can't give you any more for free. Um, and we wanna thank you, um, Ms. Parker, um, who is Chief Diversity Officer, Global Director at Google, which is a whole lot. And I am so proud to say you're a sister with superpower. Uh, that you are sharing here at Rolling Out and, and Sisters of Superpower. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first. It, right here. We thank you. Just wanted to break out. We really appreciate you. And for all of you, come back for more at a seat at the table. But if nothing else, follow her on social and definitely take that moment uh, to do everything that you can. Um, 